All right, we are nearing the end of a fantastic day, as far as I'm concerned. I've learned stuff. And we have one speaker left who is, I'm excited to hear, um, it's Kitty Young. She is a, are you ready for this list? A physicist, an artist, a maker, a fashion designer, and a musician. That's pretty heavy, all that stuff. She's based in Silicon Valley right here. Um, she's a creative technologer at technologists. I'm sorry, I'm getting a lot of tea on my, what am I doing here? It's my necklace? Really? Oh well, beauty before function. She's the manager of the garage at Microsoft, which is a really cool organization. So her background is in natural sciences from the University of Cambridge, and she has a PhD in physics, applied physics, from Harvard. Um, but she's kept her artistic flame alive through art and music and really loves that side of it too. So after she conducted research at Intel, for a while, she says she discovered um, how to put all of this together, integrating art and design with science and technology, which is a wonderful combination. So I'll let her tell you how that happened and how her work now focuses on cutting edge technologies um, like garment design and manufacturing process in quantum computing in education. Yeah, quantum computing education. Uh, she's gonna take us on a journey to Ikigai. Ikigai, I had to look that up and I still couldn't explain it to you, which is why Kitty is going to come and do that right now. Kitty Young, welcome. Hey, everyone. Thank you for staying here for the very last talk. Uh, just do a show of hands here. How many of you do like natural sciences, or physics, chemistry type of things? And how many of you are doing more practical like um, computer science? Yeah, and what about the rest, like uh, art, design, anything else, like marketing? Great, so I will be talking to you about my journey combining many different disciplines together. So I work at Microsoft, I manage the garage. Garage is a very interesting place, it's like an internal startup, and we support internal startups. Is a platform for employee-led innovations. So any employee with good ideas, they can come to the garage, build prototypes. We have ways to help them go all the way into the market. So Gretchen actually mentioned one of our garage uh, projects in the morning is uh, the Farm Beat. If you go to our garage website, you will see all kinds of uh, projects that's already in the market and is all employee uh, generated. So that, that's a business slide. It's basically showing you that uh, the garage is a program that's engaged with our employees, with our uh, business teams, and our ecosystem. So we work with universities, and we have internship program, and we run hackathons. The garage runs the biggest private hackathon in the world. Last year, we have 23,000 people participating, all employees from uh, Microsoft, and we have uh, thousands of projects submitted. So we usually take a close look at the uh, projects and find good ones that we can help them go forward. Well, I'm an employee at Microsoft, so is a platform for employee-led innovations to pursue their passions. I have my passions too. So for me, I love science, engineering, technology, but at the same time, I love art and design. If you ask anyone in industry, uh, it's very difficult to combine different disciplines together. Usually they put, in, uh, put you in a box and that's, uh, you, you do one thing until you retire, but there's a lot of other opportunities and you have to uh, take your chance and create opportunities for yourself. So to me, science and art are actually not very different. They use similar kind of methodologies. They pursue the things people do not know, have not yet done, and they inspire the middle engineering and, and design. So in the very interface, that's where you can create useful products for people. You can create useful things. To give you some examples uh, of my projects, that's one of my work using machine learning, basically embedding a chip in the dress that can detect your hand motion. You can train the chip to remember your gesture. 
So after the training, every time you wave your hand in the correct way, a correct constellation will show up on the dress. And it is also using my graphic novel, a page from my graphic novel, the scientist and her robot looking into the telescope. And in the sky area, it caused the constellations to show up. So I'm demoing the training process. After you train them, uh, the neurons, you can then call the constellations. I embedded four constellations using the LEDs. Um, that's uh, Cigna, you probably recognize some of these. And I have um, Big Dipper, Cassiopeia, and Orion. This was actually a um, project built on Intel's uh, Curie chip. And that actually is the only physical demo that shows you how to use this uh, pattern matching engine. At the same time, I also run a quantum computing study group in our Silicon Valley garage. So you probably hear a lot of news uh, about quantum computing in the news. Uh, they usually don't go beyond superposition and entanglement. There's not much the news articles talk about. And rarely do people sit down and study the math and understand the subject, what it's really all about. And if you really want to learn it, you have uh, those textbooks. But if you don't have a degree in uh, natural science, it's usually very hard to pick up. So in order to train people who do not have a quantum computing uh, background, you really have to have some uh, methodology, some uh, grounded material to get people uh, to understand it from concept, step by step. So I started this, uh, this group in our office to train our employees. And everyone really enjoys it because it's like, a new area that they feel passionate about and they want to educate themselves on something new, take a new challenge, and also to have the opportunity to perhaps go into this area if they want to in the future. This is also built on my, my physics background. And this is a super exciting combination that in my day job, I can do both science and art. Did I know that this is something that I would be doing? No, I had no idea. So when I was a student, I thought that uh, I would just become a scientist and uh, live happily ever after. But life is much more complex. There's a lot of challenges, a lot of surprises, but at the same time, many opportunities. I have to go back in time a little bit to tell you my previous experiences. I really owe what I do now to my study of physics. Physics let me have a holistic picture of how the world works, including how the universe works and understand, have an understanding of, uh, about humanity. I was born in the northern part of China, and then when I was in primary school, moved to Hong Kong and Shenzhen. Uh, some of you may know that's a, a very developed, technologically advanced uh, region in China. I really enjoyed reading about science when I was a kid. I was really inspired by the stars and the universe and uh, the ocean and animals and everything. Um, but at the same time, I also wanted to be a musician, I wanted to be an artist, I had all these other intellectual uh, dreams as well. But so I started thinking, how do I contribute back to the society? Uh, I found science to be the most direct way. And I thought if I became a scientist, I can probably still do art. But if I did art, it might be harder to, to still do research. So that's, I was a little greedy, so I decided to, I wanted to do all of them. So I chose to focus on uh, science. So I really started my professional journey in University of Cambridge. I did my undergrad and master degrees there. At the same time, I started working in Cavendish lab since the first year of my undergrad. So that's extracurricular. I um, found a lab uh, in Cavendish, 
and started working there as a student researcher since my first year. So I did condensed matter physics. Uh, the group is called quantum matters. So we study the quantum property of materials. You need to cool uh, materials down to really, really low temperature and measure is quantum properties like um, capacitance, resistance. Um, you need to cool them down in something called dilution refrigerator. It's a super powerful fridge that can cool uh, your materials down to 4K uh, using liquid helium. And then uh, additional phase transition can let the environment to cool even down to sub-Kelvin. That's how you can really measure quantum properties of materials. Noise is always uh, a problem to uh, show our measurement. So we need to get rid of noise. And, and because this is super cutting edge research, we even had to make those equipment parts ourselves in the workshop. So there I learned how to use the, the lathe, use the different um, components to create, uh, to shred or make parts from metal. That was a very important experience for me later on as a maker. And I wanted to do more applied science. So in Cavendish, it was more uh, fundamental. So I wanted to see how I can apply my knowledge into actual products. So I decided to pursue my PhD and very luckily got into Harvard uh, School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. There I pursued applied physics. Um, my lab invented a new type of electronics called plasmonic circuits. Um, any of you heard of plasmonics or plasmon? Yeah, a couple of you, great. So plasmonics are, uh, plas oh, plasmonic waves are waves that are generated in electron systems. If you have a bunch of electrons put together, uh, you can create a wave, they have collective interaction, so uh, the wave can propagate in your material. You can confine the electron into two dimension. Because of the dimensionality, you can give the material uh, interesting properties that you wouldn't see in 3, 3D. So because of the, these properties, we could uh, confine them onto the chips, create circuit structures on the chip, and guide the wave through the chip and to manipulate the, the wave. So you can propagate information that way and create structures that can manipulate the wave to get the effect that you want. So I learned a lot in the clear room. So basically, I did things from scratch, um, coming up with a system, theoretically prove it, and simulated it. And if the simulation works out, I would go into the clear room and fabricate the materials myself using e-beam or uh, uh, photolithography. And then design the experiment, measure them, then publish paper. All the, the whole process. Because of the skills that I learned in grad school was applicable for uh, silicon photonics. So I got into Intel after I graduated. Silicon photonics is very similar to plasmonics. So instead of using plasma waves, this is using light wave. You can confine light onto two-dimensional uh, chips and manipulate the light propagation. Where this is used is in the data centers. So we, we do not touch the data center uh, every day, but we are, if we're using it all the time. Uh, whenever you connect to the internet, with your phone, with your computer, you're using data center. And in data center, there are many racks of servers. Between the servers, you use optical fiber to connect the servers. But between the optical fiber and the servers, you need an interconnect that can convert e electrical signal and optical signal. So that's what we were doing using silicon photonics, is the interconnect that would, um, that would help you send light and manipulate light, and is for infrastructure, for data, center, uh, telecom, uh, data centers, uh, optical communication. I thought that I would be working on this for a long time as a research scientist. Th this is super fun and very useful until I discovered something surprisingly interesting. Um, are you familiar with open source hardware like Arduino? The boards that you can program, you can uh, put sensors and components on the uh, microcontrollers. So Intel at that time was making these 
uh, chips that would go onto those microcontroller boards. Uh, so I uh, work on the Joule module and the, uh, the Curie module. So those are kind of super small microcontrollers and mini computers. You can embed it into all kinds of things. So you can, you can create your own things like uh, robots or uh, drones or IoT devices. And for me, I uh, really like design garments, so I embedded that into fashion design. To give you an example, that's uh, using accelerometer again to detect the arm motion so it changes the color on the optical fibers. I also made these kind of glasses. They can communicate through Bluetooth. So they, they, are, com they are synced and can change from, opt uh, they can change from uh, transparent to opaque at the same time. So imagine you're wearing one of these glasses on the street and you see a stranger approaching. Hmm, you're wearing similar glasses, so you may have very similar fashion taste. If your heart rate matches, Maybe you can change, check each other out. So you flip from <laughs> sunglasses to transparent, you can see the, the eyes. So this is actually an exploration for me to um, provoke human-to-human -human interaction using technology. So instead of human-computer interaction, I wanted to see how, if we can create things that would encourage human communication uh, with the aid of technology. Just like if you have dogs, uh, if you, your dogs uh, play together and you, you will start talking. And also um, play with other types of open source hardware. So uh, Intel had those modules, but there are other vendors, other uh, brands that create all kinds of small chips that you can embed into clothes. There are ones that are specifically designed for fashion design. You can, you can sew them using conductive thread. And I learned to play with them and use all kinds of inputs and outputs to create all kinds of interesting things. So the democratization of hardware really helped creatives to get their hands on technology. They can apply those in all kinds of industries. So outside of work, I created uh, more garments. This one uses brain signal to control the, the colors and patterns on the dress. The headset is from a company called Brinco, so you can sense the intensity of your thought. And use that to, uh, through Wi-Fi, you can control the, the chip on the dress. I have this earlier version that, that's not using input, it's just hard-coded color change. But all of these are using my, uh, my paintings on the fabric. This is called the chaotic earth in a peaceful universe. I also had ones that had uh, mechanic motions. This one has like wings that can move and falling leaves simulated by the randomly blinking LEDs. Uh, and the last one, oh, this is a 3D dandelion, because my painting is the dandelion. And I also had this painting of Jupiter. You can rotate the storm of Jupiter by rotating the satellite aisle on the shirt. These are actually just a background, a backstage recording of uh, uh, San Francisco Fashion Week in 2016. So I designed 12 pieces. Half of them had uh, electronics technology in embedded. The other half were multi-weights. And all of them had my paintings on the designs. And the theme of that, that fashion show is called Tech Drives Fashion. I really think tech is the future of fashion and it's the future of all traditional industries. At the same time, we also use the uh, Intel architecture to create something useful. I actually form a startup inside our company with three other friends from different groups. Uh, we had this little startup team that we build uh, wearable devices for health and safety, and we won a competition and also got traction and um, interest from our internal v v VC funding, um, and we filed a patent. Everything was going really well, and I, I was learning a lot about startups then. Inside a big company, you can also learn about startups, and you can gain experience. Um, you can understand how it is like to actually build a startup. 
while everything was going in the right direction, <laughs> my happiness didn't last very long. Intel decided not to pursue the maker uh, direction and wearable direction, so the products got cut. That actually happens. That happens in companies. Sometimes the upper management, they would make decisions that you may not agree with. And uh, this was really heartbroken uh, because um, open source hardware is also about education. So it was really sad that we decided not to pursue this direction. So I went back to Silicon Photonics. I could do my job very well. I like it and it's uh, useful. But then I realized something. Uh, take a look at this Ikigai graph and identify yourself, see where you lie, which region you lie. So for me, I was just a little bit below Ikigai. So I was missing something that I love. I felt that I was using only half of my brain, not the other half. Because I had a taste of my dream job and that was gone, so I was um, not satisfied anymore if that doesn't combine with my um, profession and, and love together. But I realized that products can be cut, groups can be reorged, but no one can take away what I love to do. If the environment doesn't allow me to do what I want, I can still do it. I will keep doing that. I got a lot of support from uh, the maker community. My work was noticed. I kept on doing more designs. And I also explored different types of technology. This one is using 3D printing. 3D printing can be considered as one of the most mature new technologies. You, anyone now can buy a 3D printer, not for very um, much money, or you can use services to get your design submitted and, uh, and print it out. So through projects like this, I was trying to figure out how I can scale my ideas. How can I reproduce? Is it possible to uh, make multiples of these designs? So I learned how to do 3D design. This is on Fusion 360 uh, and uh, SolidWorks. And a lot of menu work still. I had these parts printed and had to sew these onto fabrics. Through this process, I was trying to figure out if I can convert what I was making by hand into something a factory can reproduce. So it didn't take very long for my work to be noticed by Microsoft. And I was uh, then hired by the garage. It's really a very a helpful environment to support employees to pursue your passions. This one was uh, my first build in the garage. It's using our 3D printer. Um, I made this holder for a solar panel. This You can walk outside and charge your phone at the same time. I actually uh, walk around in Maker Fair for a whole day and my phone ran out of battery. I plugged it in. It was really useful. and. Um, most of the uh, so, uh, solar powered jackets that you can find uh, in the market are having the solar panel vertical. But if you need enough sunlight, you need to have this angle. So I thought that, that would look ridiculous. But then I may as well make it avant garde. <laughs> so I just you know, I designed this, uh, ho uh, this backpack holder that's based on the pattern on the fabric. This I wanted also to show that this solar panel is not designed for fashion. It's just a, a portable panel you can carry uh, when you go out. But if with clever design, you can embed it into a uh, fashion design. So that goes with any hardware, any technology, I can design it into something wearable. This, I, Opportunities opened up. Uh, I got people sending me their hardware and their materials. This is from my friend uh, who works at Sati Institute. He has a company called uh, Made of Mars, and he works on Mars exploration. Uh, they pr want to use this material from volcanic rocks to produce daily appliances and items. These are volcanic rocks that are put into fiber and then weave into fabrics. They're usually used for um, 
very heavy duty industrial applications like wrapping uh, tubes, uh, high temperature applications. Uh, but then they want to see if it is possible to design something fashionable because this material is abundant, is everywhere on Mars. So you can find on Earth in places like Iceland or Hawaii. But if we learn how to handle this material on Earth, once humans do leave to, uh, to Mars, we can know how to build things using the raw materials there. And at the same time, I, I took this as a design challenge, but then I thought, when and why should we ever go to Mars? Is it because the Earth environment is terrible? Is it because the uh, pollution is too bad that we can no longer live on Earth? So I started put uh, to as a concept, I put a optical dust sensor in the front so it can detect the air quality. Using a Adafruit uh, circuit playground, it has the different sensors including temperature sensor and buzzer and LEDs. I use it to detect the temperature and the air quality and the sound and the color of the LEDs can give warnings when something goes wrong. So this is a concept to warn people, uh, even that we are doing exploration in outer space in our solar system, we should still um, take care of the Earth environment. So this warns you about uh, global warming and pollution. This is my latest build using the EKG heart rate monitor that can detect my heart rate. I put the electrodes on three different parts of my body and they can blink the LEDs according the heart, to the heart rate. You can see the uh, EKG graph on the photo. I wanted to show people that uh, for fitness and health devices, we don't have to stuck on the wrist. There's enough products that, that are uh, just accessories. Why can't we explore putting that into our beautiful clothing and daily wear? I had a very good education. I uh, really enjoyed my past experiences, things that I learned in school. But there are things that I only learned after I started working in industry. So first thing here is the environment. As I mentioned earlier, you get hired for your skill sets and sometimes you get put into a box that <laughs> if you have great ideas, creative ideas um, that may not align with your business group, if the environment doesn't support you, you, you f will find it very difficult to pursue. So having the environment that allows you to expand your imagination is very important. I am very lucky to be in such environment and as a earlier, older generation of millennials, I can relate to a lot of younger talents that they, ha they are so interdisciplinary, they learn all kinds of different uh, subjects. But if we as an established industry do not provide such growth environment, people are gonna be unhappy at their jobs. So we have to change some current structures in established industry to allow young talents to grow and give them opportunities. The other thing I realized was scaling. A lot of things that we did in the labs are proof of concepts. We, we build things in the lab, we do experiments, but then we really need 10 to 20 years to scale it, to make things that we invent in the labs into a real product or something that's really useful. You need hundreds of engineers to work on it. And one thing I think would, could be helpful is um, doing open source. So when I create my projects, I will publish them on open source platforms so anyone can learn how to build something similar. I actually learned a lot from the maker community and I wanted to contribute back by sharing what I know about the materials and the components. You can also find all of these projects online on the open source platforms and build something that you like. Maybe not in fashion, maybe in something else. Um, but not all of my uh, friends are a maker. Not everyone's maker. I got people ask, how do I actually buy your things, uh, buy your designs? 
So out of curiosity, I was thinking, how, how does it take to actually produce some of my design into real garments can, that can be sold in the market? So I managed to produce three designs in the market last year. They all have my paintings on them, with this one using a uh, lenticular piece that would change from an eclipse to a full moon. That's also my painting. But then you ask, where's, that, uh, where's the electronic, where's the high tech? Turn out it's not that easy. Turn out that the industry is actually not developed enough to produce such inventions. So this was a design that I made for Intel two years ago. It's just a t-shirt with a wearable robot and some soft electronic uh, circuit on the fabric. Turned out that the robots are much easier to produce. So anywhere with hardware background, it's very easy to get that done. But then the soft part is actually more difficult. We had this, um, uh, I basically built this prototype by hand, had to hand stitch the conductive thread onto the fabric. If we want some factory to make this, we couldn't quite find good places to do it. And eventually we could find a, uh, some maker space to help us, but that would cost us $100 per t-shirt. So that's not really acceptable. That made me realize the problem in the industry that actually uh, some of our ideas that we have now is not quite achievable. It goes around in this negative cycle that's impeding us to pursue our designs. So creative designers, they can make things by hand very easily. They can do whatever, anything that they, they can build by hand. But then they really rely on manufacturers to scale it, to produce products. But manufacturers, they refuse to do it until they see market. They have to see that what they are making can make money. But Mass population would not generate demand. They would not show market until they see some existing product that's already in the market. So this is really backward. And it then also shows a couple of problems that's in the manufacturing chain. So there's not enough automation. And if we want to put tech in garments, that's currently very difficult. And there's also not enough made to order. That's actually one of the major problems in fashion industry. So fashion design actually lacks tools. I can attest by doing different uh, artistic endeavors, tools really advance the arts. So music, the invention of instruments, can help musicians express their emotions, their feelings. The invention of the modern piano really helped Beethoven start writing a different genre of music from classical to romantic. And I was painting my um, graphics on the computer about 10 years ago, I started doing that. That's because of the invention of these tablets that you can plug into your computer and start drawing on digitally. So then I could print my digital files on any surfaces, including different kinds of fabrics. The technology allowed us to achieve our idea much, much easily and faster. The existence of 3D design software can allow us to build 3D printed structures without going into sculpture. So fashion design is left behind. I wanted to understand why can we make things, make garments the same way as how we make electronics. With the background of chip design and manufacturing, I could see a lot of parallel in those two manufacturing processes. We always start with 2D design. We, we represent our different materials and different layers of things using 2D layouts. Um, the upper one is what we would draw to represent the circuit. And we send this file to a clean room, a foundry. We have a couple of engineers to help, but most, mostly is file driven and automatic. The machines know how to read these files and lay out different materials. And then you can produce chips, you, cut the, uh, you can produce the wafers and you cut them into chips and then solder them onto PCB boards. 
The PCB board is also, again, design file driven. As long as you can draw these 2D files, you can get things produced easily. And then you can package. The packaging is also by design, by those files. Well, for garments, you also start with a design representing a 3D structure in 2D. You draw out the, the patterns, and then you give this to pattern makers. But then in this process, it goes back and forth so many times. Uh, first time, the usually fit is wrong. There's a lot of human error in it, and you have to correct the fit. And then the second time, the fabric is wrong because the first time they don't use the actual fabric. So if you change the fabric, there will be a mistake. The third time, when those things are corrected, it's missing details, it's missing buttons, and you already would tell them at the very beginning, you show them the design, but still, many, many back and forth, a lot of exchanges and waste of time and effort. It's not this as streamlined and efficient as electronic manufacturing. And eventually, you can get your design, your prototype into factory, and people working in terrible conditions. Eventually, you, you produce things like that that's super cheap and not creative. No one wants to buy them. You go discount, discount, discount. Still in the shop, is lying there. No one wants them. Guess what? Eventually, those goods get burned. We actually produce a lot of waste and pollution in garment industry. So just by, you can just search online, the pollution generated in garment industry is well understood. And one of the problems is the overproduction. Why do we need to make so many pieces of clothes if no one wants them? And that's the problem that I really want to solve. That's where I can see how technology can help resolve this issue. Right now, I've showed the collaboration between research, uh, things that you invent from research centers in labs. You can make them open source, and creative people, when they get it, they can make things that actually people want. You can make functional things and aesthetic things. And then you use education to, uh, to educate more people, younger people in school, educate the market. Anytime you introduce anything new into the world, you have to convince small people. So this ecosystem, these different communities, they have been working together. But what we are lacking is a way to help creativity and need-driven manufacturing. Right now, that's not there. That's a very big problem. And it's not letting creative people to achieve their ideas and the technology has been not available, not democratized for anyone to use. For anyone to um, produce something from a initial sketch to a 2D file and then into an actual garment, it's got a lot of processes. But we can really help this whole chain of production using all kinds of technologies. In your design, you can have things like 3D, um, avatar of yourself so you can get your fit before you, you know how the garment looks on yourself. Uh, you can use uh, mixed reality platforms to do that. And there's computer vision that you can apply in fashion. Uh, right now, a lot of uh, the ideas have been looking at a picture and then referring you to an uh, existing product and then uh, recommend what you can buy. But what if we can take a picture of a existing garment, someone on the street that you really like, you take a picture that will automatically be generated into those 2D patterns that could be sent into the factory and get produced much easily. So we shouldn't be making things that overproduced. We should only be making things when someone wants it. You can make the platform, the 2D uh, pattern, available for people to choose. I want this kind of color, this kind of bodies, this kind of sleeves, and I want my own combination. At the factory level, all these files should be driven automatically and letting people tap into this manufacturing. And they could produce a lot of similar colors, similar bodies and sleeves, but then eventually you have a different combination according to 
people's orders. So you shouldn't be producing things until someone already orders them, already backed it by an order. And at the same time, in those processes, we can then think about how do we put uh, those electronics, those microcontroller functional uh, electronics into the fabric. Right now, I showed things that we were using uh, uh, open source boards to do, but then we really need to scale it uh, to sh shrink it down to very small sizes and make it flexible, make it part of the fabric to be able to make it comfortable. So there's a lot of problems in the industry and is really a engineering problem. I feel like this is not, this is a hard thing to do because of all these different parties in the ecosystem, you have to combine them. There are each individual technology that's out there, but we really need to combine them, link them together to solve this vertical industry. But it's also not that hard because it's just engineering. We just have to turn a few engineers into fashion designers. So that's what essentially a platform company would do. We need to empower everybody. We need to empower the creative, the designers, give people the technology so they can, they can decide what to use the technology for. And this will help creativity to drive production other than uh, profit driven or volume driven. That's producing many waste and pollution. So what I found out through my journey is basically knowing what I really like to do and applying different disciplines together, but at the same time scale it to something bigger, to something more impactful. And don't wait for anyone to give you your dream job. If you want to work on something, just go for it. Even if your day job is not allowing you to do it, eventually you find your audience. There's also not enough discussion about later support of women's development in tech industries. So what if you are going to have a baby? What if you, your partner is moving to a different place? There needs to be enough support to allow a woman to stay in their industry, stay in their field, pursuing their jobs, and why staying with their loved ones? It shouldn't be a either or to choose between your career and the family. There should be environments that allow us to pursue all the things that we treasure in our lives. The environment is very important when you want to decide your future. And also, what we contribute to the society should be intellectual. There's a lot of noise in social media, on all those platforms that we engage every day. But we find out that if we look back into history, is the intellectual value that distill and pass down generations. We always listen to the best music, read the best uh, literature from the past. The noisy things in contemporary world would not pass down. What I found very important is that when we generate our content, it's very important to stay intellectual. I sometimes look into our own world like an alien from outer space to understand the beautiful and ugly in our world. When we are in our 20s, we probably would look around and trying to find all kinds of opportunities, trying to get as many experiences as possible. In our 30s, we kind of learn how to focus. We find the vertical that we want to spend the rest of our life in. But sometimes people in their 30s, some of them become the most, world's most famous bigots. And uh, uh, some people, uh, they regret they haven't become the world's most bigots. But what I'm hoping is that more of us, most of us, will stay true to ourselves. Whenever we look back deep down into our hearts, we, we can find a child inside ourselves. Thank you.
I don't know if there's question time or. Anything in the things that I presented or something that I missed in my presentation? Yeah, over there. Uh, thank you for your presentation. It was fantastic to see all your different work. Um, and I really like the chart that you showed about Ikigai. And I'm curious how often you like revisited that or how often you go back to looking at it and making sure that what you're doing throughout the years was um, reaching yeah, those goals. Yeah, I, I think I only look at it once <laughs> so far. Uh, only when I, if I would revisit it is probably when I'm not happy. So when I'm unhappy, I can look back into the chart and reanalyze my situation. Yeah. Fantastic presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, when is your, your quantum setting study group? Who's eligible to attend? So right now it's only internal. Um, and we host it every other week. Uh, usually depends on my schedule <laughs> because, yeah, uh, right now it's me leading it. But then through this this workshops, more people are interested, so they volunteer to teach. So we are doing like beginners track. We cover those fundamentals, and then we would do some more difficult um, algorithms, like using the concept that we learn in actual programming. And also we would invite external speakers to talk about maybe hardware experiments that they do to give us the industrial flavor of the, uh, the field. Um, we are making some tutorials and hopefully we can, um, we can share it with the public in the future. Uh, but right now the, um, the Q Sharp team, the Microsoft team, they have publications, they have their um, different aspects of quantum computing already on the website, so you should look it up. Thank yeah. You. Yeah, you can feel free to chat with me during network. Thank you.